we are recording now the presentation. So um, we'll be able to share that with you later if you want to share it with any of our teammates that were not able to participate today. Um, we will share that and to our schedule um, preceding this presentation. Uh, so now um, I'm going to hand it over uh, to Abby Bish, who is the AVP Experience in Business Development for the Franklin Institute. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to apologize if you hear yelling outside of our building. We have three million people celebrating the Eagles win in the middle of a victory parade right now. Um, so I keep hearing Eagles chants as I'm sitting here on this call. Um, I'm really excited to kind of talk to everybody today about this exhibition, which I think is a great um, topic and opportunity um, to bring in kind of a new audience and connect with our existing audiences um, around the subject matter. Um, this was something that was presented uh, to the Franklin Institute by Quirk Books, who is a local publishing company here in Philly who does a lot of great stuff, and David will talk a little bit more about that group. Um, we do not take on um, special exhibitions here to build from scratch and tour. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to kind of bring in um, a partner to help us develop this exhibition and to tour the exhibition. And thought immediately of Jeffrey Curley and EDG, um, thinking about Mythbusters and kind of the design aesthetic with that exhibition um, and the opportunities with this kind of topic. And thought it would be a great uh, chance for these guys because we haven't had a chance to do that yet. Um, so that's kind of how we've gotten to this point. Um, in my role, I spend a lot of time trying to find topics that not only reach the school group audience, um, has that kind of science spin to it, but also super entertaining and fun, has an opportunity for that kind of adult millennial audience as well. We also do a lot of evening hours and evening events and corporate groups, which I think this um, kind of lends itself to. So I'm really excited to have... David talk about this, and Jeffrey talk about the exhibit, and I hope you guys um, kind of enjoy the presentation and happy to take some questions at the end. And I'm going to send it off to David Borgenick, who is the CEO and founder of Cork Books. Thanks, Abby. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining and for uh, making this happen. Um, so uh, back in 1998, um, Y2K was all anything anybody wanted to talk about. It was, uh, it, it was, it was survival was in the air. There were books like The Perfect Storm and uh, Into Thin Air on the bestseller list, and I was trying to uh, come up with book ideas. Um, and uh, one of the uh, one, one, something clicked when I read an article in Esquire magazine about a man who had to land a plane without the benefit of the pilot. The pilot had a heart attack and the article kind of took you through step by step what happened. And something clicked with me there. Uh, it tied into all my childhood fantasies of being James Bond and Indiana Jones and Bruce Willis. And I realized there were real world answers to all the things that we fear, that we see in action movies, all those situations from shark attacks to um, running from the bulls that we see in the media and on movies, in movies. And, um, and, I, and I realized there are actual experts in the world who know what to do in those situations. And that's what really inspired the first book um, back in, in 1998. Um, so I started working on it, uh, found a co-author here in Philly, Josh Piven, to do uh, half the research with me. And we ended up presenting it to Chronicle Books who published it a year later and um, right before Y2K. Um, and very quickly, it just caught on. It was it was just the right idea and the right package at the right moment, and um, and the world just really loved it. It became a, a huge publishing phenomenon. The next year, it hit the bestseller lists. We were all over the media on to the Today Show in 2020 and in People Magazine, and. I think part of the appeal was that it was both entertaining and real. It was that people didn't know if it was a joke or if it was uh, the most awesome survival guide they ever needed. And uh, and um, it just really, really worked and, and has stayed in print for the last almost 20 years. Um, you know, and, and we thought our work was done. Uh, <laughs> we thought we'd solved all the problems that there were. Um, 
but sadly, here here we are in 2018 and 2019, and and uh, things are are no better, maybe even a little worse. We've published over two dozen different books since then, um, but haven't really been active in in new publishing for the last few years. And uh, for the 20th anniversary in 2019, we're planning a major relaunch of the first book, um, featuring all new updated information for the original content, um, 20 new scenarios for our, uh, our, our more recent fears. Things have changed a lot in 20 years. Now we have to worry about drone attacks and, uh, and, and how, to, how to safely resist. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, there's, there's all sorts of new technology and, and new situations that are out there. Um, and so we're thrilled to be relaunching the first book in 2019 with uh, Chronicle Books. Um, we have a brand new virtual reality game coming from Magnopus, who does amazing virtual reality stuff with NASA and Disney. Uh, and that's releasing later this year. Um, we're talking with National Geographic and others about um, a whole new kids series of books. Um, and we have a lot of other plans in the works. So this is really just the start of the relaunch of, uh, of this, this awesome brand and this book that um, still is, is really a kind of pop cultural touchstone for people. It, it, people love it because it's, it's fun and funny, but they also love it because it contains real information. And we thought it was, um, it had always been a dream of mine to, to do an exhibition with it because I think the science of survival, the hows and the whys of it are um, just such a great aspect of, of uh, the book itself and also just the, the potential learning experience around it. It can be a very hands-on um, kind of learning experience from uh, not just how to survive, but um, what it is that, uh, what the factors are, um, you know, how, how things are when you panic, how things are when your heart rate goes up, um, what environmental factors come into play, what um, all the different things that come into play when you're faced with a life or death situation. So um, we're thrilled to be partnered with the Franklin Institute and the design group about uh, for, for this exhibit and, and hope it's something that we can really make big, certainly in 2019, but hopefully for many years to come. I think I'll stop there. That's wonderful. Now, um, thank you so much, Dave, David. I really appreciate that. Um, moving further into the presentation, I now introduce Jeffrey M. Curley with Jeffrey M. Curley and Associates, who will go ahead and dig deeper into this amazing exhibition. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us today. Um, <clears throat> so I'll follow up on that, just to sort of talk about this one small branch of uh, worst case scenario. So we, we're thrilled to be working on this project and bringing in a lot of the, you know, high adventure interactive experiences that we've had with some of our other um, exhibitions. Uh, but first we want to look at, you know, who this is able to be targeted towards. The, the beauty of the worst case scenario is just who is already attracted to these books. Um, when they first came out, uh, you know, the, the uh, there was a great interest from, you know, men, college age through um, uh, through mid middle age, uh, from college educated to urban. Uh, and then as the books expanded, they really dug into younger age groups as well. So we have this this really breadth of, of kids through, you know, middle and now, you know, uh, older generations who have either grown up on these books or are engaged by them. So uh, it it automatically just by the content delivers a family friendly environment so we can really look at again creating experience that not only ties you know the kids to the experience but also kids and families uh, and even more importantly looking at how we can create experiences that engage both younger people by themselves and older people uh, who want to come by themselves as well uh, so it's it's really um uh, it's really a, it's a beautiful experience for uh, kids, families, uh, millennials, as we're all trying to uh, engage that new generation of, of museum goers, uh, adult groups, and of course, um, all sorts of social groups. And of course, there are always challenges that all of us are uh, 
you know, bound to get into. The beauty of the worst case scenario is, is that uh, the way that the books are presented, like everything is uh, kind of an, uh, obviously you're going to be put into these bad situations. So, so it's really a survival guide for these kind of absurdly true situations that maybe you might possibly get into. How they're presented is like, you, of course you have to know about this because someday you might, oh, I don't know, be buried alive and have to figure out how to get out of it. Um, so with that, we, we go into an experience that you know, trains us for what, uh, what we need in order to prepare ourselves uh, for those experiences. It allows us to really hit a lot of the, the top points that are uh, on uh, educational mission, which, which looks at how we uh, observe, how we uh, 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 sort of test the environment, uh, how we take the information that's around us and apply it. Uh, a lot of what Dave was saying is, is, is keeping calm, understanding the situation, and moving clearly through it is the core of every situation that you get into, whether it be you know, trying to uh, not sneeze in a meeting or, or whether it be uh, trying to land an airplane without a pilot. Uh, all of these scenarios really have that core understanding of yourself, uh, of self-control, observing the situation and applying the knowledge that you have towards it. So with a lot of what we've learned from some of our other experiences, Mythbusters and Sherlock Holmes, we've applied that here uh, to the exhibition, The Worst Case Scenario. So here's a, a, the floor plan. Generally, it's about 8,000 square feet. Uh, it is flexible. It's, um, it's uh, a lot of sort of plug and play, uh, uh, different interactives. Uh, we're, we're pushing 300 plus guests an hour. So it is modular, can fit into a lot of different spaces. So whether we have a larger space, a 10,000 square feet, it expands uh, smaller spaces, we can work within them. Uh, it's heavily interactive throughout. Uh, it's very organic in that way that we want to explore. Uh, we want to find out the solutions on our own, uh, and then we can recap and learn from graphics as well as uh, from the interactives, uh, either before or after we participate. Uh, we do have escape scenarios within here, uh, and there is some staffing, and we're trying to keep that as low as possible, um, but there's definitely a couple of people that have to be in there just for safety's sake throughout. So you can see that there are three different areas. There's the Hall of Fame, uh, which is an introduction. Uh, we'll get into that. The Survival Gymnasium, which is just that as a gymnasium, and then we have our escape areas towards the end to apply what you've learned. So the Hall of Fame, this is where we meet uh, the real experts. So all of these scenarios were researched and, uh, and the, the actual uh, uh, way out of them has been brought to the books and also to us through experts in the field. So we meet some of these experts, they discuss some of the situations that they've been in, share those scenarios with us so that we have an understanding that this is true, this is real. There are things that we can learn from these scientists, from these experts uh, in the field. Uh, we are not going to have real artifacts. However, we will have some objects that we're going to be touring around with it, tools that the experts use. Uh, we'll also have some graphics, stories, and videos. Uh, we will also include in here some of the artwork. The worst case scenario books are, are filled with, with really beautiful illustrations, many of them extremely humorous, um, many of them just, just beautiful. Uh, and those illustrations, too, will be applied to this first gallery, getting an understanding of where we are. It's a lot like an introduction room to, oh, I don't know, a gymnasium. Um, and, uh, and then we'll have an introduction to what you have to do. So this is the introduction to what you're going to be doing, why you're here, and how you can best apply yourself to the experiences you're about to get. And then we'll jump into the survival gymnasium. Within here, we have a couple dozen uh, uh, survival situations that we apply ourselves to. Uh, some of them are highly interactive, that's about 12 of them, and then another 12 are more didactic driven. Uh, the highly interactive ones are uh, really scenarios that are based upon survival techniques, and, uh, and the didactic ones are more humorous and social in, in driving. So there's still activities you can do with them, um, but, the, but the primary interactives are with the um, survival techniques. So you can go through here, you can see some of them again are kind of uh, uh, fun uh, and playful, such as the boring class or the bad day to escape. Uh, and then other ones are a little bit more meaningful, uh, such as how do you escape from being buried alive uh, or capture a runaway golf cart. 
So I'm going to go through a few of these scenarios as we go in. Uh, we're, we're definitely taking our influence from some of these new gymnasiums that are coming out. They're, they're basically obstacle courses that um, push the boundaries of what an obstacle course is. So there's an image here of one that's actually in Toronto. Uh, and it's, a, it's an extreme obstacle course. We're taking that guidance and applying it to this uh, experience. So we're going to see a lot of those uh, very simple in design, but meaningful in, um, in physicality uh, interactives. So things like being buried alive, uh, we simulate that uh, by being put underneath, say, a ball pit uh, and doing the same techniques that you would need to do in order to climb your way out of, uh, out of loose soil. Uh, falling through the floor using a, a, a tire to simulate the hole in the floor. How do you actually pull yourself out without falling further? Uh, quicksand survival using the same techniques of uh, simulated water such as balls uh, and then using um, uh, the techniques to be able to float on top of that uh, simulated water very similar to what quicksand is. Um, continuing on, keeping calm is extremely important. So there are a couple of sections interactives within here, understanding challenges and getting over them, mostly in an obstacle course style, as you can see in the images here. An overturned car, trying to get in and out of such a, a car that has uh, been flipped over in, in a way that you are not familiar with uh, using some of these uh, simulators although we probably will not be actually turning the car with people in them uh, just due to safety sake, but, uh, but creating those environments that are new and, uh, and uh, confusing typically for people in those situations. And then of course, how do you escape a bad date? Applying some of those techniques of slipping into the bathroom and maybe changing your appearance so you can get out without being observed. Uh, losing your glasses, uh, using a, a maze style interactive where it's more frosted and um, uh, very, um, uh, again, visually confusing. How do you get through such a, such a place that's foggy and full of reflection and, uh, and bright light? Uh, Teeter-totter table, this is a great groove activity, something that we'll be using later on in the experience. Uh, how do you keep uh, such a table uh, teeter-totter from flipping to one side or the other? Uh, and of course, using a runaway golf cart, um, here applying physics as to how you can use uh, friction or slowing the golf cart down without using brakes. Uh, would it be rubbing it against something else, using the momentum to pull back up a hill, such things as that. And then as we step into the last area of the experience, uh, we look at three escape uh, uh, rooms, essentially. So we're, we're taking these uh, from the lead of escape rooms, uh, which we've been working on, probably all of us have, uh, and applying that to the exhibition. So each one of these are abbreviated. They're only five minute escapes. So part of it is actually getting out and part of it is gaining points. So the, the more that um, you have learned in the gymnasium, the more you can apply here and the more successful you will be. Uh, obviously within here we have to look at flow and ensuring as many people as possible can go through without it feeling congested or rushed, um, but these um, uh, timed games will help us uh, push people in and out of these very realistic settings. So the freezer, uh, again, very true. Uh, we'll be dropping a freezer right into the gallery space uh, and the group of upwards of 10 people will be locked in. So some of the things that you gain points on and, and hopefully you'll be able to get out in time uh, is how to unlock the door. How do you keep warm if you can't unlock the door? Uh, how would you be able to find water or consume food if you're uh, in the freezer for longer than um, a day or so? Uh, and then what would you do to attract attention? So all these things are uh, group oriented experiences and working together, you gain more points to get out. Lost at sea, uh, similar situation where you're trapped on a, um, on a raft, uh, but this time you're surrounded by water. You're also surrounded by heat and sun. Uh, so again, how do you keep calm? How do you attract attention? If this was navigable, how do you navigate? Uh, keeping warm at night and of course cool during the day. And then uh, how would you get uh, food or water? Chances are you would be in a raft for much longer than you would be in a freezer. So there's some different challenges here uh, with the duration of time and the tight quarters for all the people who are there. And the last uh, escape experience is a uh, car on the ledge. Again, using some of the techniques that we learned in the gymnasium, keeping calm, uh, figuring out what, what the balance point is on this car. You don't want it to go further over the ledge. 
Uh, so there's um, obviously things that you need to do to ensure that the balance is correct and keeping the car on the surface instead of flipping over. Uh, using the tools within the car, such as seat belts and things like that, how do you uh, create um, some tools with, with what you can find? The, the speed in which you escape, you're gonna get points for, and, and of course, how many people survive. Uh, the more people who survive, the better you do. So that's the whole goal with, uh, with that last escape. So that gets us through the experience. Now, of course, we have some additional elements that, uh, that we tie into all of our experiences. This is steeped in STEM. Of course, there's a lot of educational programming. Uh, the Franklin Institute will be partnering and, and leading the educational programming for the experience. So all throughout the uh, continuation of the design development process, the Franklin will be there and also creating a uh, educational package that will come with the experience uh, to the venue. Um, it, as, as all of our experiences are, this will be bilingual, so Spanish and English throughout the entire experience. Uh, so we can include uh, some of those um, uh, neighbors that may not typically get the opportunity to come to the museum. Uh, engaging millennials all the way through baby boomers. Uh, this really is just by uh, inherently through the books and, and also through the physical experience and how much fun it is. Uh, it ties into really everyone's uh, excitement from kids all the way through. Uh, we will have a marketing style guide uh, to help market uh, with the appropriate IP with the books and the exhibit. Uh, and then we'll help you uh, in developing after our programs. This is just prime for after our programs, private events, uh, corporate events, team building, all of those things that we can do after hours to help with the, you know, sort of support the revenue opportunities and also get another, another group of, um, of guests into the experience to, uh, to take advantage of the worst case scenario. And if you ever run into a mountain lion, try opening your coat first uh, and to see, uh, see if they, they kind of peel back. So the nuts and bolts, I'm gonna um, sort of hand this back over to Abby and talk about some of the funding we have for this, but uh, we are counting on you guys to make this thing happen. Uh, as you know, uh, experiences are uh, expensive and the way that we pay for them is, is through working with uh, those who are going to be bringing them into their museums. So the more we can do with pre-sales, uh, the quicker we can get this up and out. Uh, so we will be um, uh, depending upon you to, to help us out. And of course, there's a, a benefit to jumping on board uh, earlier than later. So uh, I'm excited to see what you guys think of all of that and, and we're, we're ready to sign you up. So please, uh, please consider it. Thanks, Jeffrey. So this is Abby again. Just wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the funding model around this. The goal of this exhibition and a lot of the exhibitions that I'm trying to work on are, are finding something that is um, just a lease fee, moving away from kind of the revenue share model that becomes difficult to um, kind of plan for um, in a lot of museums. Um, and also the goal of bringing on kind of early adopters that are going to help fund the design of this. So looking for people that are interested in hosting the exhibition that could kind of do an early kind of lease fee um, down payment um, that goes towards um, building of the exhibition, allowing kind of the early adopters to be picking their first slots, um, and really allowing us to kind of push this forward for a fall 2019 opening um, here at the Franklin Institute and kind of traveling from there. Um, really excited about kind of the extra revenue opportunities that come with this exhibition. Um, kind of programming that we hope to develop that we can share as part of the package. Um, we do a lot of after hours and corporate team building events. We have escape rooms here at the Franklin Institute. So we have a lot of experience in this area over the last kind of year uh, doing this kind of programming. So we're excited to have that be part of this package as well. So not just looking at kind of plopping an exhibition into the space, but really building out um, various opportunities from a revenue standpoint and an engagement standpoint when we're bringing these exhibitions um, to different buildings. So that's kind of the goal on my side um, and kind of the great opportunity I see with this topic um, and happy to take any questions. Yeah, feel this free to... Matthew in Denver. So what do you guys see as the initial buy-in? Oh, 
we're, they're definitely going to take yeah. Sure, there are two different opportunities. So there are two different lease models. Uh, one is a, um, a standard lease model, which is the 85000 per month. Um, so we're looking at that for a three-month rental. Uh, that would be- Can you repeat that? It was beeping, right, as you said the figure. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. It's uh, 85000 per month. Okay. For the lease fee, and that would be the standard lease fee. Uh, and that would typically be a three-month rental. Um, and that includes uh, bringing someone out there from our team for installation to help support your team install it. And it also includes uh, shipping. So that's, that's hopefully helpful as well. Uh, we're just trying to make it as simple as possible. There's one number uh, that, that you have to deal with. Uh, and then if you are an early adopter, as we like to say it, and uh, you're able to pay for the entire experience up front, which will make it so that we can make these experiences happen, uh, we give, a, I think it's a 20% discount. So it, it drops down to 80, uh, sorry, drops down to $75,000 per month. Um, a significant, significant change if, uh, if you can make that happen. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Lisa here, how long is it going to be um, on view at the Franklin? How long are you going to, for that premier site or premier venue? Um, we are going to host it from the fall of 19 um, through the spring. Um, so I think the, that next slot would be like a Memorial Day um, opening for the summer of 2020. And we will, um, I will share the tour schedule uh, with you all um, in attendance here after this presentation as well. I'll follow up with the, with the copy of the presentation and the tour schedule. Are you looking at any kind of a discount if you have um, more than three month increments? Yes, we are, Lisa. We'll discount it based on the additional weeks that you're going to be hosting. So you can let us know once you get that tour schedule what dates you're looking for. Yeah, yeah I'm just thinking, you know, if you go um, at least six months, if not nine. Great. <clears throat> Answer is yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. I think there was a question that kind of popped through on the chat. Did you guys see that? Yep, and I just received one as well because I'm up in beautiful Canada. And their question is, um, are we going to try to do a tour uh, that makes some contiguous sense through the U.S. since it's launching in the U.S. before it goes to Canada? Uh, we typically see Canada as our partner uh, in North America. So it's really a first come, first serve. Um, and we have... Uh, for anybody outside of the United States, um, thank you, Jeffrey, for mentioning the fact that we're doing the simple all-in. Um, that's really for uh, America only. There will be a bit of an inflation factor for transportation outside the U.S., since we do have Australians, Canadians, and uh, Europeans on the line. So naturally, we'll have to add a bit of a, a inflation for the freight. I also have another uh, question here that popped up on the chat. Um, what do we see as the facilities requirements, ceiling height, crate storage, et cetera? So with the uh, facilities requirements, uh, we will need to have a team from the institution helping to install it. We're looking at approximately six people for about two and a half weeks for install. We'll have one person coming out to help manage that team. Uh, we're looking at seven trucks. Uh, and when it comes to crates, we are designing this in such a way that the crating is uh, minimized. So again, trying to create this as much as plug and play as possible. Uh, and that includes creating the scenery and scenic elements to uh, ship either without crating or with crating that's applied to it. So it, it really lowers the storage necessary. There, of course, will be some storage necessary, but um, not as much as you would typically have in some of our other experiences. Um, the ceiling height, everything is designed to 10 feet, uh, so that uh, we can fit inside of a 10-foot 
um, experience, and uh, we will need to have um, uh, at least a double man door to be able to uh, install into the ex uh, into the uh, exhibition hall. However, a loading door would be far better. Does anybody else have any of any further questions? Um, you were t you were estimating that you could get 300 people an hour through the space. That's yeah. based on the miss uh, based on the MythBuster model. Yeah, the MythBuster model is slightly larger than that. Uh, we're at 350 an hour at MythBusters. With this one, uh, the the bottleneck is at the experiences at the end. So those three escape areas. At 10 people per five minutes, um, essentially it's a six minute turnaround, uh, you get a max capacity at 300. Now there, there's already been question if we can raise that uh, and we will during the design process look to see how we can do that. So it may go up to 12 or 15 people that can go into those escape rooms at any one time, which of course would bring us back up to about 350, 375 per hour, which, which I think would be the sweet spot for it, but no uh -huh. less. And how many staff members do you anticipate uh, needing to kind of queue people up, help them out of the ping pong ball room? Um, That's amazing. Yeah, to facilitate to facilitate the enjoyment and the full of the full experience. Yeah, it depends upon uh, how how heavy the flow is during the day. I would say at any one time there should be no less than two. So maybe one person managing. Uh, escape rooms and one person roaming the gymnasium, the Hall of Fame does not need a staff person. Uh, now, as flow increases, we would want to increase the number of staff, uh, as you said, to ensure that the guest experience is, um, uh, is good. Uh, so with that, with that in mind, probably the highest staff you'll be looking at is three in the gymnasium and two in the escape rooms, but that would be at full capacity. Any more from the group? Is 8,000 square feet the bare minimum square footage? It's not. Uh, we can work with you and your space to modify the experience to fit within it. Um, we, we, probably the, for the entire experience to fit into a box, uh, we wouldn't want to go much below 7,000. However, since it's designed in such a way that the that the three gallery spaces, if it's not going to be an upcharge or if we can find another way to extend into other spaces, we can pull out the Hall of Fame and place it perhaps outside of the gallery space uh, and the same thing with the escape room. So we, we have uh, in the past with other experiences, other exhibitions, uh, taken 9,000 square foot exhibitions and put them into uh, 6,000. So it, it, depending upon what your space is like, I'm sure that we can figure out a way to reduce the, the square footage or modify it so that we can expand in different places. What is your, um, what is your anticipated funding period? I mean, in order to open in uh, in fall of 2019, how how many how many buy-ins do you have to have to by what time to move forward with that anticipated opening? Hi, Lisa. Um, great question. So we already have five museums committed. We would like uh, two or three more to commit uh, from today's webinar. So I think we're feeling comfortable that we'll reach that. Um, so thank you again to everybody who was early um, subscribers from Aztec when it was really just a vision. Uh, there wasn't a great deal of um, concepts fleshed out. So Jeffrey and the team and Abby have done such a beautiful job of getting us prepared for today. And hopefully we can uh, round up at least three more. Okay. 
This is Dave. I just want to say thank you for everybody. Um, I'm the, um, and you know, just to throw in, I know this will not incentivize anybody. It might in fact dissuade people, but uh, we are really um, we're totally prepared to help uh, market this in creative ways. We love to like tailor scenarios to your regions and and you know can come think of all sorts of creative ways to partner with you guys um, when the time comes to come up with um, worst case scenario survival handbooks to your cities, your regions, um, take content that's not just from the exhibit and give it to you guys to use in, in other ways. So we're excited about that and, and happy to participate in any way we can with launches and any of that stuff should the time come. So um, we're really psyched about it and, and hope uh, together we can make the world a safer place. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a perfect closure, David. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Your... Thank you all thank for making you. this presentation. This is great. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Yeah, thank you so much for joining. Um, like I said, uh, we will do. We will follow up with each and every one of you. So thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Alrighty. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you from Bye. Australia. Bye.